Welcome to Dungeons and Collaborations, a player's handbook to working with distributed teams. Or as my clicker gets synced. I'm Roland Lee. You can find me on the internet at Roland T. Lee. Um, I'm from Washington, DC. I do a lot of rhyming. Um, I'm a software developer at Aetna. And most importantly, I'm a level nine wizard. So show of hands, who here knows what tabletop role playing is? Cool, cool. Now where are my real nerds at? Yeah, there we go, there we go. Uh, regardless if you have played or this is the first time you've ever heard it, um, we're gonna have a session zero where we're gonna set expectations and get on the same page. So what's tabletop role playing? Is it like a board game? Sort of. You take turns and you make moves, but there's no winner. Is it like an RPG video game? Kind of. You tell stories uh, with characters, but you're only limited by your imagination not what the story in the game makes you do. I'd say it's collaborative storytelling governed by a set of rules. Where three to five players act as main characters in a story, and another specific player plays as the game master or dungeon master, DM or GM. They facilitate the story. They act as the supporting characters, they're the terrain, they're the monsters. They also act as a referee and help adjudicate the rules where the end goal is not to win, but to create a compelling story using rules as a narrative device. Now that we're all on the same page of what an RPG is, um, I wanna walk you through my journey. And that starts with getting the right game with the right people. Just like having the right culture at a right company, this can spell success or failure. But we're gonna tackle the easy part first, the right game. At their core, games reward behavior. Scrabble rewards having a great vocabulary. Risk rewards military strategy. And RPGs are just the same. Some reward combat, some reward storytelling. My approach to a problem is different um, if I get rewarded for killing the monster versus overcoming my own character flaw. And this led me to the game Dungeon World, created in 2012 by Sage Latora, a senior test engineer at Google, and Adam Cobal, a professional GM. Or as Adam Cobal calls it, hipster Dungeons and Dragons. It has the same genre conventions, wizards, elves, uh, but it's mechanically different. And that's because it's powered by the apocalypse, which actually means it's a fork of a different game. It, it, it's weird, RPGs have forks of forks of forks, um, just like programming. Giving it a distinct feature, uh, the 2D6 mechanic, which means I, as a player, will describe an action. I slash the baddie. The GM will then prompt me to make a roll of two six-sided dice. Uh, this will be the same that you'd see like in a game Monopoly, Catan, Craps. Uh, then, if I roll a sum of 10 to 12, I succeed, and the GM narrates. You slap him to the ground. Seven to nine. I get what I want, but at a cost. You slash him, but then he gets you back with a dagger. Two to six. I fail completely, but the game gives me experience so my character can grow. Your attack completely whiffs. The baddie kicks you to the ground and your sword falls from your hand. So the game teaches me I can either succeed from my actions, or the worst case scenario, I can learn from my failure. Now be it the interview process, or finding people to play with in a niche role playing game, getting the right people is hard. Here are all the different meetups I could be playing Dungeons and Dragons at in the DC metro area. There's no dungeon world meetups in DC. So how do I follow my passion when it's not available locally. I went to the internet and I found this website called Roll20. Um, it's a place where RPG players can collaborate. It's kind of like Google Hangouts plus a whiteboard uh, plus dice rolling. And I was able to find a group there where uh, they, I could play Dungeon World at a time that works best for me. But just because I have a group doesn't mean it's the right group. And that's something I have to work for. And that starts off with having the right expectations. Be it starting a new job or a new project, 
uh, knowing what I'm getting into really helps my happiness. And just like we did before, we have, we have a session zero. This is a meeting where we talk about our personal goals and kind of figure out what we want to be the tone of the game. Say, is the game going to be like Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones? Both are fantasy, but they're very different. If I think we're going to Mordor to drop off the ring, then halfway through, my teammate slits my throat and says, Jamie Lannister sends his regards, I'm not going to have a great time. But just like professionally, uh, I got to be adaptable. I'm still playing a really niche uh, game on the internet. Um, here's a great example of what can be done. Say the player goes, I want to be a pirate. Jim goes, that's a dumb idea. I'm saying my game the desert. Can't be a pirate. There's no pirates in the desert. But this brings us back to this old advice in RPGs. Never start with no. Always ask why. So let's roll it back. Let's say the, the idea just didn't get shut off and we're then at a standstill. We could say, well, why do you want to be a pirate? I want a sweet boat. Oh, what if your boat traveled on sand dunes instead of water? Here, we're not focusing on the tactics and getting entrenched in it. We're focusing on how do we create solutions for each other. I use this as a technique a lot when I'm trying to spec out feature development um, with the products and other, uh, other developers. So we're going to actually get into some gameplay. Um, I'm going to kick that off uh, by meeting the party. Here's our game master. Um, he's played by John from Florida. We have Hawthorne, our cleric, who heals people. She's played by Luck from Australia. We have Kaivo, our thief. And he's played by Josh from Texas. He's from Dallas, but don't hold that against them. Uh, we have Wisteria, our druid. She shapeshifts. And she's played by Lucy from California. And we have yours truly, wizard extraordinaire, master of magic, lover of fireball, Uri Ronley from DC. We're five people across four time zones and two continents. So the bare minimum thing we can do is respect each other's time zones. Uh, we play from 5 to 9 p.m. Eastern Sunday nights for me. That means luck is playing from 7 to 11 a.m. Monday morning. So if she needs like an extra couple of minutes to get ready, like she deserves it, and we'll just get her uh, back up to speed later on. But also, like when 9 o'clock rolls around, I need to get out and get ready for the next day. We're also three men and two women of different races and ethnicities in our 20s, 30s, and 40s. So we need to think beyond just the bare bones of time zones and being overall empathetic. In my old group, we're all just 20-something dudes who had the same jokes and the same humor, which was fine. But when I started playing online with people I didn't know, I had to be more thoughtful in my expression. For example, if I said the dragon looks like a Charizard, I can't count on everyone in my group knowing what a Charizard looks like. So who here knows what pair programming is? Yeah, OK. Mob programming? OK, yeah, where you pair with more than one person. We're going to do something really weird. Uh, we're going to mob GM this game together. Um, I'm going to sh like shout out a question like, what color is the dragon? Green. Great, yeah, it could be green, red, OK. Turqu We're going with turquoise. I love turquoise. Um, and I'll, we'll do something like this. Uh, our party has just slayed a turquoise dragon. And they're looking to celebrate a hard-earned victory. Where and how are they celebrating? Alamo Drafthouse Ritz. Yes, they're at, they're at the Alamo Drafthouse Ritz. Um, so they're all there having a good time, hearing this person talk about uh, RPGs. Um, Kaivo, um, he's eating like, the Royale with cheese. Hawthorne's still kind of skimming the bingo sheet because she th really thinks she could get a black owl if she tried hard enough. Uri's bragging uh, to the person next to him how he singly took down the turquoise dragon. And Wisteria is just kind of silently watching like, with her hands on her ears like this. And everyone's having a great time. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, people are munching, talking. Then all of a sudden, down the ramp, 
this dwarven man walks down, and everyone turns and sees him, because most people know who he is. And if he's around, things are probably not good. He approaches the party up in their row, and he says, Greetings, I'm Hannah Meyer, head of the town's guard. Our archduke has been kidnapped, and we need you to rescue him. Our intel says that he's stuck in a cabin in the woods. Uh, but stop by Ada, our shopkeeper, and she'll sort it out for your perilous journey. But hurry and make haste. Our party nods. They take, the, they take this challenge. Player tip. Use vivid language when describing a situation. Uh, the more details you hear, the more of a shared vision we can create in the theater of the mind. Just like in software development, uh, seeing a stack trace is much better than just hearing, oh, it's broken. And seeing a detailed user story is better than hearing, make it pop. So um, we're going to fast forward. Uh, the, the group uh, makes a polite exit of the conference while everyone's still there. Uh, and they get dressed, and they head off to the shop to see Ada. They approach the shop. It's fairly small. It's like 10 yards by 10 yards. Uh, then there's a counter that wraps around the room. And on the other side of the counter, there's wooden shelves that go all the way up to the ceiling. And on the shelves are just basic stuff, uh, clothes, dry goods, first aid kits. But there is a specific item on one of the walls. It has this ore to it. Um, it's a weapon. What weapon is it? Double-bladed axe. Double-bladed axe, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, as they approach the counter, this woman jumps up and loses her mic uh, and says, Hello, I'm Ada. Hannah Meyer says you're going to stop over. Is there anything, anything you need is on the house? Uri walks up and goes, Yeah, this hike's going to be a doozy. I'm going to need a new pair of boots because I'm going to get my good shoes dirty. Yeah. You need good foot protection. Those woods are mighty dangerous, as she slowly glances at her left hand. She turns around, grabs the boots from the shelf. And as she grabs the boots from the shelf, she can see that she's missing a fingertip. She hands them to Uri. And as she hands the boots to Uri, uh, she can, you can see a ton of scarring on her hand that could only come from battle. She hands it to Uri glancing at her hand again and says, anything else you need, those woods are mighty dangerous. Remember to repeat key details. In remote work, sometimes the audio cuts out, or even at the basic level, uh, people just misunderstand what's being heard. And even if they did hear it correctly, hearing it over and over again reinforces importance over minor details. There he goes. Now I'm fine. And walks out. Ada says, OK. Hawthorne then approaches Ada and says, I can use my healing magic to reduce some of the scarring and so you would feel less pain. But I don't know if it's powerful enough to bring back uh, the fingertip. Well, that's mighty gracious of you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, but you, you seem to know a lot about these woods. Is there, are you an adventurer? I, now and then. And here's a good tip for you in those woods. Anything can hide in the trees, and anything can hide in the bush. But you always better be on the lookout. Play it. Active listening. This is a technique commonly used in conflict resolution and in management, where a listener listens to the speaker and how they say it, then paraphrases it back to them. Um, I found this especially useful in software development and uh, RPGs because we're using, we're in such a high fidelity of information that it acts as a checksum between both parties. After Hawthorne finishes healing, Kaiba's looking at that double bladed axe up there. And it just caught his attention because he loves shiny things. And it says, Yeah, I got that my last trip out in the woods. Um, it's yours if you want. We really need our Archduke back. Um, and you're going to need all the help you can get. Kavo, being gracious, 
says thank you. So we're going to fast forward to the woods here and say that the party's done about a day of hiking or so, and they're looking to make camp. Um, and they've made camp, and Uri's on watch. Everyone else is asleep. Uri, what do you do? Well, I just took down a turquoise dragon. I think I can handle a simple rescue mission. I'm going to make my way to the cabin. Cool. On your way to the cabin, um, you see two goblins on patrol. These are obviously probably the goblins that, stole, or that kidnapped the Archduke. What do you do? I cast Fireball. You rolled an 11. Success. They turn to Ash. What do you do now? Like I said, this is going to be super easy. I'm going to get closer to the cabin and take out the rest and get the Archduke back before breakfast. You get to the cabin. You see two, guard, uh, two goblins guarding the entrance. What do you do now? I cast Magic Missile. You rolled an 8. Partial success. You take the one goblin out, but the other goblin knocks the wand from your hand. What do you do? Punt him. Ten, success. What do you do now? I open up the door and say, Ur is here to save you. Don't hug the spotlight. That might have been a real cool series of events for Uri, but there's three other players at the table who have completely checked out because um, they're not involved. Just like in programming where we try not to be cowboys or rock stars, in an RPG game, don't, be, don't hug the spot, spotlight. As you burst through the door, you see and smell a dark gas. Um, what do you do? I cover my mouth and hold my breath. Ooh, you rolled a six. You pass out. Let's check back in with uh, the rest of the party. You all wake up um, to a sound of an explosion, as if someone casted fireball a while back. What do you all do? Well, the shopkeeper said that anything could hide in the trees and the bush. So someone should go look out. That sounds like an amazing idea. I'll turn into a bird and fly around to see if I see anything. Yeah, you see two goblins hiding in a tree, or like in, a, in some bushes, actually, like underneath a tree. And one goblin says, what's up with that wizard? Does he know things could hide in the trees and the bushes? I know, right? They're not done with that conversation. Uh, 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 I mean, like, good thing we sent word to the boss. I know, right? I go and tell, what Sarah says, I go and tell the rest of the party. Kaiva, what do you do with this information? Well, I got this double-bladed axe. I don't want to try it out. OK, what do you do? I'm going to take them both out with one swing. 12. He got them both. Um, they fall to the ground. Hawthorne, what do you do? Um, I cast Speak with the Dead. Uh, this lets me ask three questions, um, and they have to answer truthfully. Cool. You rolled a 7. Um, this means it works, but you won't be able to use it for the rest of the session. What do you ask? Where's Uri? Uh, the boss has probably got him. Who's your boss? Uh, he's a mind flayer. And how do we defeat him? Uh, he's afraid of spiders. And then there's this, like, this magical double-bladed axe that, that's somewhere in this forest. I could kill him in one swing. Oh, OK. That's, that's really convenient. Thank you. <laughs> what do you all do with this information? Well, I'll turn to a spider. And I'm going to sneak into the cabin um, to scare him. OK, you sneak into the cabin. There's Uri. He's passed out. There's the Archduke, who's also passed out. Uh, and there's the Mind Flayer um, standing over him. What do you do now? As the spider, I jump on one to his tentacles, getting right in his face. Oh, yeah, he does not like that. He starts screaming around the room. <laughs> Kaivo. What do you do during the, uh, all this commotion? Well, I'm going to sneak in all sly like through the door um, while he's screaming. 
and take him out. Cool, yeah, donezo. Hawthorne, what do you do? Well, I heal, I heal the Archduke and Uri back to health. Remember, play off each other's work. Uh, just like programming, not everyone has all the skills, so it's important to delegate and collaborate. So the Archduke says, well, I was in the forest doing research. Then the mind flare got me. However, before then, I was able to find these stones of far speech. Uh, they let you communicate with anyone anywhere in the world, no matter the distance. Uh, I want you to take them as a gift for rescuing me. The group graciously takes the gift and says thank you, and let the, lets the Archduke on his way, escort the Archduke back to the city. Let's talk about end of session. Um, at the end of our four hour sessions, Dungeon World asks us to have a retro, where we ask three questions, and for every question we say yes to, we get to a point of experience. First, did we loot a memorable treasure? Yeah, we got the Stones of Far Speech from the Archduke. Did we overcome a notable enemy or monster? Yeah, we defeated the Mind Flayer. And did we learn something new and interesting about the world? Yeah. We learned techniques to help us better collaborate. Um, we learned how to set expectations and just starting having the right game with the right people. I wanna say thank you to John, Josh, uh, Luck, and especially Lucy who did all the artwork for this uh, presentation. Um, for teaching me so much how to work uh, uh, better, to be better at working together um, remotely. Here's my information, uh, Twitter, email. Uh, also, if you ever want to reach out to Lucy, uh, here's her email as well. Cool, thank you.